Hello and welcome to Analysis with me, Jonathan Steele. Somalia has been hitting the headlines this week over the continuing hostage crisis in a Kenyan shopping centre conducted by Somali Islamist militants. The seemingly never-ended instability in the country has been blamed by many for the rise of the militant al-Shabaab movement, who have recruited many people disenfranchised by spiralling poverty and conflict. The latest blow for Somalia has been the news that the banking giant Barclays is to cease money transfers to the country, which has put many in fear that a crucial financial lifeline may be cut off. Sarah Say has more. Two decades of bloodshed, poverty and lawlessness in Somalia as a result of its ongoing civil war continues to stand in the way of a country trying hard to rebuild itself. Just this weekend, we have seen the devastating consequences of this ongoing civil strife spilling over into neighbouring Kenya, where at least 68 people have been killed in an upscale shopping mall in Nairobi. Al-Shabaab, the Al-Qaeda-affiliated Somali group, have claimed responsibility for this attack, saying the attack is retribution for Kenyan forces' move into southern Somalia in 2011 with the intent to cripple Al-Shabaab's capacity. This current situation will also likely be used as further justification for a decision by Barclays Bank to close the accounts of 250 money transfer businesses on the 30th of this month, which includes Dahab Shiel, the largest money transfer business providing services to Somalia. This move by Barclays has been prompted by fears within the industry that money transfer companies have been used for money laundering, which could lead to money falling into the hands of terrorist organisations, with HSBC being fined $1.9 million for not having adequate enough checks in place to detect money laundering activity. Barclays is the last major bank to make the decision to pull out of providing banking services to money transfer companies. However, in a country where there is no formal banking industry, money transfer companies have provided a vital lifeline to many Somalis, and companies such as Dahab Shiel have maintained a good reputation in money laundering prevention. At least 40% of Somalia's population relies on remittances sent from relatives living abroad, with remittances making up half of Somalia's national income, dwarfing international aid. Somalis in the UK alone remit $500 million a year. If Barclays goes ahead and terminates transfers accounts that deliver necessary funds to civilians in Somalia, the consequences could be devastating. On the ground, people would not have no other means. No other means. I mean, what they would resort to is, um, I'm afraid that is a question that, you know, starvation will return, the famine will return, the chaos will return. So on the other words, they won't have nothing to resort to. You know, they have no way of, 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 of getting money. And that includes, I would say, 90% of the money that gets to um, um, Somalia is through money remittance. And international charities use it, individuals use it, and also um, people who are building civil societies. If you want to build a hospital, you use money remittance. If you want to build a school, you use remittance. And there is no way of actually getting money to the ground. So I'm afraid that, is a, that, 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 that question, I would say, you know, they can't resort to anything. It, you know, it will, be, it will be chaos. Last Monday, EU and Somali leaders arrived into Brussels for an EU donor conference for discussions on Somalia's reconstruction. But absent from the discussion was the impact Barclays decision could have on the prospect of economic, political and social recovery in Somalia. But a major campaign is underway in the UK asking for Barclays to reconsider the pullout of Somalia and to give more time for alternative methods of getting money into the country to be found. I raised this matter with the uh, Treasury Minister, Sajid Javid. I also personally um, uh, approached the Chancellor uh, uh, about three weeks ago uh, and asked for a meeting. And he uh, sat down with me and said he would look into this issue. And he was concerned. But obviously, this is a matter for the regulatory authorities. Um, and so what we need is for the government to follow up on what they said, which is that they would bring together, once again, the banks and the regulators uh, and the agencies to find a lasting solution that enables people to be able to send money to their families through legitimate means, which is what they had 
um, until this decision was made by Barclay. If this planned pullout on the 30th of September goes ahead, the further instability that may come about as a result may mean that the scenes like the ones we have seen over the last couple of days in Nairobi may become a more frequent occurrence. And any gains that the country has made in moving towards lasting peace and security may be severely jeopardised. Sarah Say, Islam Channel. Joining me in the studio to discuss these issues is Emmanuel Aguizzo, Executive Manager of Somali Relief and Development Forum, Abdul Rashid Douane, CEO of the Dahashil Group, and uh, by Skype, Ed Pomfret, the Somalia Campaigns and Policy Manager at Oxfam, and by telephone, Paul Schulter, Senior Visiting Fellow in the Centre for Defence Studies at King's College London, and also former Director of Proliferation and Arms Control at the London Ministry of Defence, the British Ministry of Defence. Let me come first to you, if I may. Um, how serious is this damage going to be done by this, by cutting off the money to your trusts? Uh, it's, a, it's extremely serious for those Somalis who live around the world, who, li who regularly send money to their family, as well as the humanitarian agency that use companies like the Hapshell. Uh, on the 30th of September, unless Pakistan changed their mind, the last four remaining Somali companies who serve the community, as well as the international community, will lose their account. And that is one of your companies. And, and, and we are one of them. Right. Uh, and, and already the Somalis company lose other accounts they had with the other banks. So these are the four remaining accounts. This will be a really disaster for Somali economy and it will affect uh, those who rely on remittance from diaspora. Not only will it affect people from outside, but also will affect people inside the country because... Well, how many people are affected by it who rely on these money transfers? The World Bank and the United Nations uh, estimate remittance going to Somalia to be around 1.6 billion American dollars annually. So around 4 million people rely on receiving $100, $200 all over the world. And this kind of transaction is a lifeline to many community. And Pakistan made a decision uh, to close uh, the Somali companies, I, I may add, but also some other uh, Bangladesh companies serving Bangladesh and some other country. They haven't closed all the remittance companies. They are keeping certain companies, uh, which I may add, some of them had their own legal problem in the world, in the mm. US, and others they had a penalty. But to close all the Somali companies, you, we, we believe it's unfair. Why Somalia? Because Somalia doesn't have a banking infrastructure that can link to other banks in the world. So if you go to any bank in the world today, tomorrow, and say, I want to manage, send money to Somalia, you can't. Mm -hmm. Because there's no banking infrastructure, there's no direct link to the banking community. Well, so, let me talk, ask Ed Pomfret uh, from Oxfam. Why is um, Barclays doing this? What's the reason? I think that's really a question that Barclays has to answer. What we've seen over uh, quite a long period of time is many banks, both in the United States and in the UK now, closing down um, bank accounts of money transfer operators like the Habshiel and others. And this is really due to a perception of risk um, due to anti-money laundering and counter-terror regulations. And that's why one of the one of the main asks that Oxfam has is for the United Kingdom government to pull itself together, bring together the Treasury, the Foreign Office and the regulators and the banks and the money transfer operators and really all work together to find a solution for this because it, it's a perception of risk and it's a perception of how the regulations might impact on the banks that really seems to be pushing them to do this. Well, is there any evidence that there is money going to terrorist groups? I mean, perception of risk you talk about, is there any actual proof of risk? Well, so far, I mean, uh, um, I'm sure Abdi Rashid will, will have more on this, but so far there hasn't been any um, prosecution of any Somali money transfer operator. I think it's worth, it's worth remembering that most of the, of the remittances sent back are very small. They're, they're usually less than £200, and they're usually around, you know, £25. And this is just to support love, loved ones back home. It, it's people in the UK who are earning money and are obviously earning more than you can earn in Somalia, just sending money back to the families to, to pay for basic costs like food, water, education, healthcare and clothing. And, and that's, the, that's the real issue is 
the impact on the Somali individuals. So wouldn't one solution be that uh, there might be a restriction saying you cannot send more than $1,000 at any one time or $200 or something or 200 pounds, you know, some low ceiling on each individual amount? But I, 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 that, that, could be, that could be one thing that people could consider. But on the other hand, you know, if you are if you're in the UK and you are earning, I don't know, £1,000 a month, um, surely you should be allowed to support your family to the extent that you, you feel you want to. And I think the, the sort of, the, there are solutions to this, um, and they are things like clarifying the regulations, making sure that everybody's clear and everybody's on the same page as to what the regulations actually entail, what money transfer operators should be doing. And there's, there's also a need for money transfer operators themselves to improve the the delivery of money inside the country itself and make sure that the money does actually reach the recipients it's intended for and also make sure that they they are clear who it's going to i think one thing as as oxfam i mean we've delivered cash programming cash money to people in somalia especially during during the famine and, and we actually handed out money to identified individuals who are in need of this. So I think, you know, there is there is experience on the ground and people, I'm sure Dahab Shil and others, have experience of delivering money to the people it was intended for. And the fear and the perception that it could fall into the wrong hands, I think is is really it's too much you know we we need to we need to make sure that it does get to the people it's intended to sure but also it seems like the money is getting to those people it's intended for well emmanuel how serious do you see this as affecting local people in somalia for sure it's gonna be affecting the people dramatically i have to consider that as an organization representing the diaspora members we have been receiving several calls of very, from the public, asking us how they can sort out this issue if this is going to affect them. And honestly, we had to answer clearly that, yes, if the Apshil and all the other money transfer uh, operators are not going to be able to operate anymore, for sure they won't be able to support their loved ones back home. And when I'm talking to women that are supporting sisters and family back homes and are asking me how I can send my 100 pounds, my 20 pounds, is really uh, heartbreaking because from a perspective of business, the decision of Barclays is to reconsider the risk is taking in making business is fair, but on the other side, you have an impact and the possibilities of having a Another cri humanitarian crisis in Somalia is something that we should avoid as much as we can. And stopping the uh, remittance companies from operating is going to most probably have a dramatic impact. Impact on the public, on the communities, on the daily life of every person. Paul well, Schulte, you're, you're there, I believe. We, we did lose you briefly. Are, are you there? No, I think we've lost him again. Let, let me come back to you, if I may. I mean, one of the points that Ed Pomfret made was that there perhaps ought to be a little bit more transparency at the recipient end in Somalia about who is receiving this money and how much they're getting and so on. Do you think uh, there is room for some change there that would satisfy the concerns of the banks? Uh, of course, uh, all this improvement can be, uh, can be done. Uh, the question is, are the banks asking, asking us things to improve. In, at the moment, they are not, they, all they're saying is that they have changed their eligibility criteria. We don't know what that eligibility criteria is. If they are saying, you know, this ABC needs to be done, we're happy to do it. We're happy to invest in it. We're happy, happy to do. Of course, we're already fully complying with the UK regulations. We have a license to operate here. It seems to be the bank do want something else, which they are not sharing with us. So that's why we're asking the UK government uh, to help us on this. Already there was a meeting they have cancelled uh, on the 16th of September. We're very disappointed that meeting has been cancelled. Now there's another meeting to be held on the 8th of October. By then, unless the Pakistan Bank changed their mind, the account, all this remaining account will be closed. 
So I don't think this is the interest of the UK government that um, uh, the industry could not have a bank account. And they still they can well, find a solution. Is it not possible for another bank? I mean, if Barclays wants to pull out, could not another big bank move into the gap and carry on doing the same job? Uh, at the moment, all the high street banks, they do, the, the Barclays Bank was the last bank to, 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 to serve the companies. So that's why Barclays Bank, uh, 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 by closing them, there's no alternative. There's no other high street banks who will accept their companies to open account with them. So the UK government found solution for other groups. They, they found certain groups to open, have an account with Bank of England. You know, they can still uh, talk to Barclays Bank. They can still talk to, they bail out much of the banks in 2008 with the UK taxpayer money. Uh, which is included the Muslim community and, and Somali community and other community who are part of the UK. Because after all, we are a UK citizen. We, we live here, we're UK taxpayer. And if somebody's working in the UK and they cannot send money to their family, obviously it's a breach of their rights. And, and that's why we're asking the UK government to, uh, to, to intervene, to, uh, to address uh, this fear. We're happy to work with them in any solution that they think will address any perceived con fear. There's a fear here. No company hasn't broke any law. We have not been accused. We have not been charged. You know, we haven't broke any regulations. Mm. It's all perceived something might happen one day. L let me see if whether Paul Schulter is, is there now. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Oh, oh great. Well, you know, people often say that uh, Somalia is a failed state and it's because of being a failed state that uh, you get these extreme militant groups like Al-Shabaab, which is now uh, terrorizing people in a shopping center in Nairobi. I mean, isn't there a risk if the, if the British government doesn't do something to get Barclays to reconsider on this money transfer issue that yet another um, element will emerge in Somalia that makes it a failed state? Because people will just have no way to feed their families. Well, I'm not sure that that would prevent the, the failure of the, what is left of the Somali state. It may, it may be important for humanitarian reasons, and I don't discount that. But the, uh, the, the countervailing risk is that money flowing into Somalia gets uh, diverted to the Shabab and other terrorist groups there. So uh, from a purely security perspective, I don't think you, you, you would logically argue for reducing restrictions. Quite the contrary. It's notable that Kenya, for example, was mentioned in the Financial Action Task Force, which is an international organization's report, as a place where there were lax controls over finance flowing in. And it might have been in, uh, connected with the organization for the recent attack. Well, Abdul Rashid Duwali, you're nodding your head against what you've just heard from Mr. Schulter. I mean, w what's your criticism? Uh, well, I, I fully respect Paul's view. Uh, of course, we have to fight against terrorism finance, wherever it exists. Nobody is favoring that. Actually, the terrorists hurt more the community that they, they're trying to portray more, i.e. the Al-Shabaab now. They are hurting more on Somali name and Somali community. They are killing hundreds of them in Mogadishu and other places. So nobody's supporting that. Let's get the fact right. Al-Shabaab used to control a certain region of Somalia. They can make majority of their finance through the ports and other means they used to control. And, you know, $200 coming from London or Minnesota, you know, has nothing to do with their attack, which is complicated. And, and in fact, by not family not receiving their money from diaspora, it increased their membership. It, it support their uh, mission to say the West is against us and destroying our community. So $200 from London has nothing to do with any of the operation they have. And as ODI, reputable organizations, recent report made, the money going to Somalia is well monitored. You can find out where the money is going, who's sending it, who's receiving it. Otherwise, you know, the, the people who are sending money will, will come to a company like us and say, you know, the money has not been received. So that's why we're saying any further improvement that to happy to any regulators, we're happy to do it. By cutting off is not the answer. It's actually opposite, opposite of money laundering, opposite of terrorism finance, because at the moment the UK government can see who's sending the money to. By cutting off these channels, they don't know who's sending money to. Yeah, that's, a very, it's going that's to. a very fair point, isn't it, Paul Schulter, that you, you're just pushing it underground, which makes it even harder to monitor and control. Well, there are underground um, channels already, um, which 
are slower and more complicated. Um, the, the argument, I think, which is used in general, uh, not just in Somalia, but for imposing more precise controls on money flows, is that if you can do that, you, you make terror, terrorist financing harder, more complicated, uh, and more expensive. Um, and now it may be that when uh, somebody arrives to Somalia, there will be more need of proving transparency. But from what I've heard, that hasn't been demonstrated yet, and that seems to me the advocacy task that needs to be done to, to point out exactly why it's, it, that there is no uh, additional risk from cu uh, current flows. Well, Ed Pomfret, um, do you see any chance that by the end of September Barclays will reconsider and the British government will reconsider, or do you think this is now uh, too late to, to reverse? Oh, it's never too late to reverse. And I, I think really we do need to ask Barclays to open the door for another year, for 12 months, basically. It's a 12 months limited period just so that the government um, can take decisive action, uh, working with the banks and working with the money transfer operators. In terms of the humanitarian situation, it's, it's worth remembering there are 870,000 people still in need of uh, acute need of food aid in the country, still in need of receipt of food. But then there's another 2 million people just above them who are just about coping, but are what, what you would call in crisis still. And a lot of these will be receiving money. And my concern is that if, if this gets cut off, what you end up doing is you end up throwing a whole bunch of more people back into crisis. And it, at the end of the day, that will cost the British government much more because they'll, they will need to... Uh, up their upscale their humanitarian aid so it we just we just need a bit of leeway and a bit of breathing space from Barclays in order for the government the banks and the money transfer operators to sort out a, a long-term solution well on that note we'll have to end and I hope we do get that long-term solution thank you very much Ed Pomfret thank you on the phone Paul Schulter thank you El Manuel Rizzo and thank you very much indeed Abdul Rashid Duale CEO of Dub to have Sheila for coming in and talking about this. And stay with us because uh, after the break, we'll be talking about the issues of Islamophobia in the wake of the Lee Rigby murder earlier this year. So stay with us. <laughs>